Ah, book by book. Welcome and thank you for joining us in Book by Book. I'm Richard Bewes and I'm joined once again by my colleague, Dr. Paul Blackham, and then by our special guest today, the Reverend Glenn Scrivener, who is evangelist with the Hour of Revival Ministries here in Sussex by the Sea. Glenn, welcome. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And of course, we're right here in Brighton with yes. the Brighton Pier right behind us. And it's great uh, joy to be in the, well, in the sunlit areas of uh, south of England here. Now, our theme is the book of Job. Don't be too afraid of it. When I was about six years of age on the lower slopes of Mount Kenya, my missionary dad took us through the book of Job as children, and we loved it then. Let's love it now. And as we come to it, well, our main theme for the whole of this little series would be, I know that my Redeemer liveth, one of Job's great phrases. And today's theme, let's take it from chapters 1 to 3, and we're going to take as our theme today God's question in verse 8, Have you considered my servant Job? So let me read a little bit now. Verse 1, In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job, the man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. On to verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going to and fro in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him? So there's two questions there. And I think we shall go on from there to ask several questions of ourselves, really. I mean, might this be the first book of the Bible? The oldest book of the Bible? Some say so. And if so, would the Lord God want to give such a book to us so early? Hmm. I, th I think it very well might be uh, the first book written down in the Bible. It seems to be all the characters uh, from the extended family of Abraham. Uh, they seem to know the Lord, uh, and yet they don't mention any aspects of covenant or uh, the, the acts of, of Moses' kind of redemption. So perhaps no, it exists no. somewhere between Abraham's time and Moses' time, which would make it perhaps the earliest book written down in the Bible. And I think the earliest book actually deals with the deepest subject in life which is the, the mystery of suffering, really. And I, I suppose the, the book of Job is, is a little bit like the book of the Bible in miniature. Uh, what we've got here is uh, in the beginning in the, the land of Uz, uh, which I think technically is in Edom. Um, I think so it actually has a place. Yeah. It, it, is an, it is an actual place. Uh, we learn that in Lamentations chapter 4. But also Uz means a wooded place. Perhaps we might start to think of something like a garden. And we've got this upright man in a garden who verse 3 says it's in the east. And verses 2 and 3, the animals under him, he seems to have a lot of dominion. And then Satan in, in, uh, in verse 6 comes along and it all goes pear-shaped. There's a kind of a catastrophic fall. And then there's all sorts of suffering throughout the book of Job. And, and then at the end, the Lord intervenes and brings a, a happily ever after that's greater than anything we had at the beginning. So really, Job's story is kind of the Bible story. Uh, and you can't tell our story without telling the story of suffering. But I think also you can't tell God's story without telling the story of suffering. Um, if Job's the first book, uh, I guess Revelation, the last book of the Bible, yeah. we also see you know, that wonderful phrase in Revelation 5 and Revelation 7, uh, the lamb at the center of the throne. Yes. Yeah. And when you think of the throne, you think of the control, the power, the authority of God, and at the center is the Lord Jesus, the suffering, bleeding victim for you and me. And you see that pushing through to the deepest depths of deity, you find this mystery of suffering. So you, you can't tell the story of God without the story of suffering. You can't tell our story without the story of suffering. So, so of course, the oldest book is going to talk about the deepest issue. So there are going to be lots of explanations in this book. Wow. To what extent is it a book of history? Or is, could it be more like a parable? So, you know, real people from real places? Yeah. Let's think about that for a moment. Well, that's the thing, Richard. As I've been studying it, sometimes I read people and they'll say, it's just a parable. Ah, and I'm like, just? What do you, I, often that's a way of not taking the book seriously as real life and real history. But when we look at the characters in these comforters that come to Joby's friends, 
the real people like Eliphaz, the Tamanite. Who's Tamer? Well, in Genesis 36, 11, it's the grandson of Esau or the Bildad the Shuhite. Well, who's Shua? That's the son of Abraham from Keturah, Genesis 25, 2. So we could go on. These are real people, real places. But more than all that, this is a real book. It's so true to life. As I've been reading the book of Job over and over in these past weeks, I think here's a Christian man who I can completely relate to his life and he's he trusts in Christ and several times he gives us these wonderful confessions of his faith in his redeemer or the intercessor or his friend on high he knows he's got Christ on high who represents him and yet he's overwhelmed with suffering and he's full of doubt and fear and sometimes despair and then he sees Christ again and he lifts his vision up and then his friends come and they're not always completely helpful. But you think, no, this is a man who's living sort of the Christian life in a way that we relate to. It's very real, mm. the it's, book of Job. Mm. It's real people. Actually, I was looking at um, Ezekiel 14, verse 14, where Job is lined up with Noah and Daniel. So these are historical mm. people. And James 5 lists him alongside Elijah as well. So Exactly. Yeah. And there, yes, the suffering prophets and the suffering Job. Exactly. Look at verse 6 for a moment, friends. Verse 6, one day the angels come to present themselves before the Lord and Satan comes with them. How can Satan, the accuser, wander into heaven whenever he wants? I mean, who are these sons of God, and why do they come for a sort of conference meeting yeah. in heaven? What does that tell us about the power of the Lord and the power of Satan? Yes, well, there is this conference meeting, I guess, in, in verse 6, the angels or the sons of God, same thing. And, and it seems that both the unfallen and the fallen angels are in attendance, including Satan himself. And here's our first clue as to the power of the Lord versus the power of Satan. When the Lord summons, Satan hops too. And, and there he goes. And, and then when he's asked in verse seven, where have you come from? Satan answers the Lord from roaming through the earth and going to and fro. I think so he's I, a wanderer. He's got no he's a wanderer, a restless wanderer all his days, that kind of thing. Uh, and also it's important that he's on the earth. Mm. His headquarters are not hell. Um, hell is his place of punishment that's being prepared for him, says Jesus in Matthew 25. Um, so he roams about the earth. And when the Lord summons him, he comes to the Lord. Uh, and then we, we see his, his terrifying proposition to strike Job. And I think it's important to see that it's, it's not the Lord who says, hey, you know, Satan, watch me strike Job down. He, it's, mm. it's not like that at all. Uh, it's Satan who makes this proposition. But then it's the Lord who permits it. Uh, in verse 12, the Lord says to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself, mm. do not lay a finger. People find that quite troubling um, that the Lord would permit that. But yeah. I often think, well, what's the alternative? Mm. Is the alternative that, that sort of Satan from his own power base just strikes Job and the Lord wrestles for his soul from heaven and there's this sort of epic duel? It's not like that. No, no I mean, that's, that's sort of Greek mythology. Terrible, that's yeah. not the Bible. In the Bible, actually, Satan is under the Lord's power. And, and you could almost imagine Satan on, on the leash of the Lord. Uh, it, it's an image that's sort of given to us in, in chapter 41, verse 5, Leviathan this supernatural enemy of God's people. He's on the leash mm. with the Lord. And, and that leash is only as far as the Lord allows it to go. Which tells us that evil is not original with goodness. Mm. I mean, Augustine said that. He said the evil angels, though created good, became evil by their defection from the good. So that the cause of evil is not good, but defection from the good. Mm. And the Lord reigns over that evil exactly. and allows it only to go so far. Mm. What about Satan's basic philosophy of life then, friends? I mean, yes. why does Satan look at Job in this way? In, a, in 1 chapter 10, does, does uh, Job fear God for nothing, etc.? Mm. Have you not yes. put a hedge around him, etc.? Yeah, all the way from, even from right back in Genesis chapter 3, Satan's philosophy is basically selfish. And he can't believe anyone would do anything for nothing. Mm. So even with Eve, he's really saying... Look, um, the Lord's trying to prevent you from getting something good. Let you take this so that you can be like God. Then you can b get better and bigger. Look after number one for a change, he's really saying to Adam and Eve. Look after number one. How a bit of me time? <laughs> and then <laughs> when he comes to tempt Jesus, he's like, you're hungry? Make yourself something to eat. Do you want the world to serve you? Well, get a PR department or something. He, he's always saying, think about yourself. Put yourself first. 
always the philosophy through the Bible is that. And so when he sees Job serving the Lord, the Lord goes, look at Job serving me. The devil's immediately, that cynical eye, he looks at that and says, he's only doing it as a mercenary. It's only because you're paying him to do it all the way through. And so in 1 Peter 5, 8, when uh, Peter's warning, the devil prowls around looking to devour people. What's it about? He's try, he, the, the devil wants us to try and run away from suffering and say, I don't want suffering. I'll do anything to get away from suffering. And because the devil's like, well, you don't want that. You need to be paid. You need to get comfort and ease. Whereas in reality, of course, I always think of Romans chapter one, where the, in a way, the worst thing that could happen to us is that we get what we want because hmm. that will destroy us more surely than anything else. So the devil says, get what you want. The Lord's like, no, that's, that will destroy you. I says Satan is out to get Job, but he's also out to get God. I mean, he mm. says he's saying in effect, "I'll get God on his best man." Yeah. And see, see how he gets on then, and then so chapters one and two are, describe how the disaster strikes. There's robbery upon uh, Job's people. There's bereavement. There's t- t- n- troubles from nature and all the rest. Then Satan again comes and starts to be allowed to afflict him personally. And then come the three comforters, and they arrive. And so, Glenn, I mean, I'm looking now, the sufferings of Job seem unbearable. Mm. He feels his own life has fallen apart. He wishes he'd never been born at all. At 3, verse 1 to 11. Mm. Mm. What shows us the deep down trust of God? Yeah, well, I mean, he does seem to despair so much in chapter 3. I mean, he basically says, I wish I was never born in about 11 different ways in in this Mm. this chapter. Uh, he, He kind of curses himself but he refuses to curse God. Mm. And that's the big thing. Um, both Satan thinks he's going to curse God and, and, and then also his, his own wife uh, in mm. verse 9 says, why don't you just curse God and die? Mm. But that's something Job refuses to do. And we've got that sort of mountaintop uh, demonstration of faith in chapter 1, verse 21, where Job says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. Mm, mm, And I think his vision of what the Lord is like is is the reversal of Satan's philosophy of life. Because for Job, it's all about what the Lord has given him. Mm. Everything's about what the Lord gives him. He doesn't say, you know, the Lord has paid me what I deserve. Mm. And now he's punishing me for what I deserve. You know, the Lord doesn't pay and exact in that kind of way that that Satan always thinks, you know, that's how God operates. That's how life operates. Mm -hmm. No, the Lord just gives everything I have is a gift of the Lord and he's taken it away now. And And I think knowing that grace from the Lord enables Job not to curse God. We're winding up our little study in just a moment or two. But briefly, I mean, why would the Lord God allow all this to happen to Job? What possible good could arise from this? kind of suffering. I mean, that's the big question of the book, isn't it? And that right away, it's important for us to confront that a little bit because in in John chapter nine, when there's the blind man and the disciples go, right, here's some suffering. Either he sinned or perhaps his parents did. That's got to be the only explanation. In that way, they're thinking just like these comforters that we're going to meet. I say comforters, (laughs) they're no comfort at all. But they they sort of go, oh, this must be, like Glenn was saying, um, God is exacting something. He, it's this payment thing. You've done something wrong, right, there's going to be payment for that. And mm. their the, the attitude is that. And of course, that's not how it is. And as we go through the book, and as in John 9, where Jesus says, no, wait, this has got something to do with the glory of God in suffering. And then as Glenn helps at the beginning, when we come to the cross, the very central thing of suffering, nowhere is the glory of God displayed more than there. And I think back even in Deuteronomy, where the Lord brings some suffering. Deuteronomy 8, he, get, he makes them hungry. And you think, well, that's not good. Suffering, make th- making people hungry like that. And he goes, so that you would learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So one of the things we're going to look at is the way that in suffering, the glory of God can be shown. And there's a way of relating to God that's more profound. We, we are brought out of a kind of, independence sometimes by suffering that's what's possible to learn a kind of dependence and trust and a closeness to the Lord God before we get to the end of the book we're going to see some of those things hey we're just about through I mean the tantalizing thing about the book of Job is that we can see the whole picture and those sons of God who came to speak with God they can see the whole picture but but Job never sees the picture at all he doesn't know what's going on some of us will make it like that we think what is God doing at all the thing about Job is that If he hadn't suffered, 
what would he have been? Well, enriched, enlarged, endowed, rich man, a good man, and he might have merited perhaps two lines out of the Bible, like Enoch of old, who walked with God and was not gone. But no, because he suffered, we've got much to learn. We've got 42 chapters in front of us. God bless you. Join us again for the next installment of the Book of Job. Thank you.